Tom is an MSU grad from 1984 in anthropology, so we're excited to have him here back at MSU to see the new Honors College and to have him a part of our curriculum. But Tom is one that has done much for the community, much for uh, the environmental groups in general, and much for just the, the artistic world of photography. He's an internationally known teacher and photographer. <coughs> I taught in Gillette, Wyoming for a lot of years, not too far from where Tom was, had a 7,500 acre ranch when he was growing up in South Dakota. But I would, I would share in the photography classes I would teach an, an image that Tom had given me back in the 80s, and it was a pamphlet that had bird wings on in the snow. And I shared that with many different students, and I would be asked, what's an inspirational photograph to you, Paul? And I would say it's this one, of the bird wings in the snow. So it was very, very special to me to have Tom here to talk. He's, I'm gonna let him talk, but I just wanna talk for just a minute. He's got stuff in magazines, from Life, to Architectural Digest, to National Geographic, to Audubon, to the New York Post magazine, as well as up for Grammys, for his work that he's done for PBS, or PBS has worked with him. And I just think it's an honor to have Tom here and to talk about his adventures and some of his experiences. So with that, Tom, thank you so much for coming. So thank you. It's a <clears throat> really a privilege for me to be here. I, 20 years ago, I did some classes for honors program under another fellow and, and uh, I told everybody since, <clears throat> the two groups of people that I like to show my work to, <clears throat> honors students and third graders. <laughs> because everybody's hand goes up and they have thoughtful questions. Uh, third graders sometimes can be more difficult questions, but they're really good questions. <clears throat> um, so again, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure where to start exactly. I'm primarily a visual person, so I kind of lean on my photographs to help me uh, <clears throat> articulate some of the things that are important to me. The uh, motivation <clears throat> for doing my work, uh, there's two main things. One, I like to eat, um, so that's, <clears throat> that's worked out pretty well. Um, <clears throat> but I also need, uh, feel that it's really important to give back. Um, <clears throat> so wild land <clears throat> and, uh, and nature uh, gives me <clears throat> pretty much everything I really need. And <clears throat> so I uh, want to be a voice for, for wildlife and wild land. And <clears throat> I felt that that uh, that <clears throat> um, the best way to do that, to tell these stories, is to understand the, the wildlife and the wild land. I grew up <clears throat> on a cattle ranch in South Dakota. This photograph that's up right now is Part of our ranch. Um, and uh, in the springtime when I had to find a cow, it was kind of a tough place to go. But um, so this is part of the east section of our ranch. Our land goes about halfway to the horizon there. And uh, it's a beautiful country. 200 years ago, there were grizzly bears, wolves, um, huge elk herds, um, and now there's cows. Uh, so again, I still find the land beautiful, but it's not wild. So that's why, uh, in 1977, I had fallen in love with Yellowstone Park and uh, <clears throat> I moved to Livingston, Montana uh, to be as close to Yellowstone Park as I could get. I've uh, never had any regrets. <clears throat> Since then, I've been lucky enough, I've been on six of the seven continents, going to wild land, all these places. I've been to Antarctica 10 times, and uh, I like cold. Um, Actually, it's a little warm in this room for me right now. But, um, and uh, again, I'm always looking for the story of, of creatures and, and the story of the land and wild land. Um, I find that wild land is a way more interesting than a cornfield. And uh, for a number of reasons. One, that's where we came from. We came from wild land. We evolved from from uh, ancestors who had to make a living just like bison and wolves and 
muskrats have to do now in wild land. And there's a lot of photographers who <coughs> illustrate human stories, which are great. Um, <coughs> um, and just as an aside, I haven't done weddings for 30 years, and I'm not ever going to do another wedding. <coughs> um, great stories, but uh, <coughs> I feel that if I can tell the story well, um, I think I can be a good uh, <coughs> part of the voice for wild land and wild creatures. <coughs> so I don't have a set spiel, as you probably guessed by now. So I'm going to run through this <coughs> slideshow. I've got about I've got 40, 45 minutes. Interrupt me at any time. I love questions. So pretend you're a third grader. If you, okay, good. You said you've been to six of the seven continents. Which one happened? Oh, Australia. I've been to Australia. Yeah. I like kangaroos too. So I'm ahead. Of it. <laughs> so captain for this is Tom. Who? Oh, Tom Murphy. Uh, <laughs> and a wildlife photographer. Uh, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time outside and. So this is kind of what I look like in the morning sometimes. <clears throat> sometimes I watch wildlife, they watch me. Sometimes they don't like me around very much. <clears throat> but again, I'm trying to tell their story. So, um, <clears throat> so this is a coyote photograph, and I, <clears throat> I think I have three levels, <clears throat> my own work and other people's work. Uh, <clears throat> you can have a photograph of a coyote. <clears throat> the second thing is that makes it more interesting is the coyote has to be doing something. And the third best and hardest one to get is a coyote doing something in an interesting landscape. So <clears throat> I love this photograph of coyote because it tells a lot more than just this is a coyote struggling in this ground lizard. <clears throat> or in this case, a beautiful landscape. This is in the Hayden Valley in Yellowstone. Uh, this windblown drifts. This guy right along Yellowstone River, uh, hunting ducks, but he wasn't having any luck. They were able to swim, and he wasn't so good at that. <clears throat> Other things under that do swim, well, uh, these are cutthroat trout. Um, <clears throat> this is a, one of a series of photographs I did for an uh, article for National Geographic on the cutthroat trout that swim over the continental, or swam over the continental divide from the west coast and occupied the Yellowstone River drainage. <clears throat> One of my favorite bears, this is a grizzly bear, number 264. Um, <clears throat> she was a <clears throat> grizzly that lived between the, on the road near the road corridor between Norris and Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone. <clears throat> and uh, she lived there theoretically because she was safe from big bears, other big males. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so she got really used to cars. And uh, <clears throat> so we got a chance to watch her hunting elk and nursing their cubs and whatever. And every morning she did yoga. <clears throat> and uh, I missed the shot right after this because she lost her balance and flipped over backwards. And I was laughing instead of taking pictures. <clears throat> Again, story of creatures. Uh, this is a young bison calf and unusual behavior. <clears throat> uh, calves will play with each other, but they rarely play with their moms. And this guy was having, she was having a great time playing with her mom. <clears throat> this is a red fox in Hayden Valley, and <clears throat> this was a year and a half ago, <clears throat> and uh, first found this fox, saw the fox about an eighth of a mile east across the Yellowstone River, <clears throat> and hunting, jumping in the air, whatever. All of a sudden she just took off like a rocket on the snow, <clears throat> ran about 50 yards, did an end over end, took off again, and caught something. I couldn't tell what it was. <clears throat> and, she dinked around over a little while, and then pretty soon she came right to me, like within 10 feet of me. And she had, this is a long-tailed weasel. <clears throat> and she walked right by me, and then off to the west of the ways, dug a hole and buried it, stashed it there, <clears throat> sat down for a little while, and came back and sat down right beside me. And looked up at me like, you're not going to eat that, are you? <clears throat> and what she did is she felt that <clears throat> I, my presence probably would keep everything else away so they wouldn't dig up her stash of food. So that was pretty cool. So I had those kind of experiences that <clears throat> um, stick with me the rest of my life. <clears throat> this is an Arctic fox uh, near uh, the Arctic Circle. And landscape, not just a shot of a doll sheep, uh, but what does the countryside look like? That's a big <clears throat> rock in the cathedral mountains in 
in uh, Denali National Park. <clears throat> Polar bears. Um, <clears throat> there's three bears in species of bears in North America, and uh, the most common is the, the American black bear versus Americanus. And the second <clears throat> most common is, is the brown bear or the grizzly bear versus Arctos. Versus means bear, Arctos means northern. <clears throat> and then uh, the furthest north bear is uh, Versus maritimus, seagoing bear, which is a polar bear. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I spent eight, eight uh, autumns, late autumns up there <clears throat> along Hudson's Bay in Canada photographing these things. <clears throat> and uh, basically, I'm not interested in going anymore because it's really, really hard to watch. Um, <clears throat> they're dying. Because of <clears throat> global warming, there's no ice. Um, when I went there, <clears throat> the sea would form would form ice about mid to late October, and then they're gone. They go out hunt seals. <clears throat> now the ice doesn't form until January, so they don't eat on land, and <clears throat> so they're basically going away. So it's <clears throat> it's kind of hard to be a witness to this, but <clears throat> um, in the meantime, they're, they're beautiful animals. Uh, this is a young cub at sunrise. And these are photographed out of a tundra buggy, and the windows are about as high off the ground as the ceiling here. And the big males can stand on their hind legs and put their noses in the windows. So they're a pretty impressive bear. <clears throat> this is another cub who uh, <clears throat> is cleaning himself on the snow. So drops his feet back, foot feet back, and puts his chin on the snow, zips around like a little Zamboni, uh, wiping the stuff off his chin. <clears throat> Mom and two cubs, this is um, kind of a cool shot. All three of the bears in North America do the same thing. When they walk, they always rotate those front feet in. They each, you know, all bears do that when they pick their front feet up. I don't know what good that piece of trivia does, but it's kind of fun. <clears throat> now, while they're waiting for the ice to form, these are young males play fighting. And it looks like they're dancing, but they're pushing each other around, keeping track of who's the toughest. And in bad weather, uh, I sort of seek out bad weather. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, it's about 35 below zero wind chill factor, and uh, of course they don't <clears throat> feel that cold at all. <clears throat> this is a harp seal off the coast of Canada, <clears throat> the Magdalen Islands, out on the sea ice. And uh, <clears throat> this little harp seal, uh, they're born, they nurse for about 10 days. And, and then their mom swims away and they never see their mother again. <clears throat> but they grow like, <clears throat> like crazy. After about a week, they're this giant ball of fat. And uh, this is right after lunch. She's pretty happy with that. <clears throat> and uh, they, <clears throat> as you know, they're in trouble too because the ice is going away. Uh, there's still quite a bit of ice in Antarctica. This is one of my favorite icebergs. Uh, this is off on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula, <clears throat> near a place called Nico Harbor. <clears throat> this is um, about a 150 foot high ice above the water and four fifths of it's underwater. So you're looking at 400, 500 feet of ice underneath <clears throat> uh, that's underneath the water as it floats. <clears throat> now, those cathedrals of, of blue ice, each of those is about the size of this room. And so what happened was you can see an old melt line above those and wave action, whatever, melted these holes in there. And then, of course, it got lighter and lighter and, and, and appeared. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I love about this um, is probably my Zodiac, I was running the Zodiac <clears throat> with uh, about six other people off this, with this ship. <clears throat> and uh, we were undoubtedly the only people who ever saw this because they're very ephemeral. It probably collapsed within the next couple of days. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I wasn't supposed to be over there by myself, so I got fired because of this picture, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Nice. <clears throat> and there are creatures, of course, that live there and prosper there. This is a, an Adeli penguin. They're about oh, 14, 16 inches tall. And this is ice that had also been underwater at one time, so it melts these wonderful spiral shapes and these glorious cathedrals of ice, like I said. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> these are the ones that you see. <clears throat> Sometimes they shoot up out of the water. They swim along really fast. 
and they can rock it up about six, eight feet off the, off the water to land on ice or, or rocks or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> they're one of uh, two penguins that only live in Antarctica, the emperor penguin and the, Adel and the Adelis. <clears throat> These are king penguins. Uh, these do not live on the continent. Uh, these live on South Georgia Island, which is a part of Antarctica, and north up into, to the tip of uh, South America. <clears throat> this is on South Georgia Island. This is part, small part of one of the colonies of king penguins. And the researchers told us that there's 150,000 pairs of king penguins in this colony. The little brown ones are babies. And uh, so each one of these is one adult penguin, either male or female, tending an egg or a little chick. And uh, <clears throat> the ocean is off to above to the, to the east. <clears throat> and uh, so the question is, <clears throat> when they take turns tending the egg and the chick. So when there's not their turn to watch the baby, why they go out to sea. <clears throat> and so when they come back, how do you suppose they find each other? They all look pretty much the same. Uh, they find each other by the sound of their voices. Just like us, they're a unique, unique voice. This is a baby king penguin. Not happy with mom leaving him. <clears throat> this is one of the more common penguins. This lives on Antarctica as well as north up into South America. This is a Gen 2 penguin. <clears throat> and uh, I love their feet. Uh, and there's some research being done that they can tell the health of the bird by the color of their feet. <clears throat> a Gen 2 um, <clears throat> and all penguins are pretty safe in the water <clears throat> as long as they're out swimming around. Uh, they're perfectly safe on land. <clears throat> so one of the most dangerous places to be is the transition coming out of the water <clears throat> to the land. And <clears throat> so this is a southern um, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, that smoke is bothering me. <coughs> so this is a male sea lion, which is huge. His head's about that far off the ground, about that big around. So he was cruising along up and down the coast in the surf <coughs> and ambushing these guys as they come out. <coughs> and uh, pretty good success. Caught this guy. Caught about six of them in an hour, I guess. <clears throat> and you take them back out in the ocean and eat them in the water, tear them apart. But I love the fact that this Gentoo isn't giving up easy. He's biting him back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so again, that transition when they're coming out of the ocean, they're pretty panicked. Everybody's in a hurry to get out. Those are, those are king penguins again. A couple of king penguins going for a stroll. Now again, they're going back and forth, like I said, from the, the nesting colony to the ocean. About every three, four days, they make the transition. And there's a lot of times in the mating season, breeding season of the elephant seals, <clears throat> there might be two or 3,000 elephant seals laying in the way. And uh, the hard part sometimes is finding a passage through those <clears throat> big blo blobs of blubber. And uh, <clears throat> they're... Elephant seals are pretty tolerant, but once in a while they jump up on top of them, they don't like that. <clears throat> so this is a baby elephant seal nursing. <clears throat> and there's a bird down there called a skua, S-K-U-A. It's a kind of a gull, and a big, a big gull, probably that tall. <clears throat> and this little guy's nursing. Of course, the skua knows about leakage on nursing. <clears throat> upset the little guy and starts yelling at the bird and the bird just jumps in and gets some more milk and just yells up and get back away from this. <clears throat> this is another interesting interaction between different species. <clears throat> this is uh, <clears throat> on uh, the Falkland Islands and that's a, <clears throat> an oyster catcher on the right, an adult male oyster catcher and then a, uh, just lost the name of the goose. Anyway, it's a common goose. Now what's happening there, if you look right below, straight down from the beak of the oyster catcher, there's a little blob on the grass there. That's a baby oyster catcher. And the goose, of course, wasn't going to eat that little baby oyster catcher, but the adult oyster catcher stood up to that giant goose and ran him off. And, uh, kind of disconcerting to the goose, because the goose wasn't doing anything wrong. 
<coughs> this is a uh, <coughs> Caracara, spotted Caracara. And I love the, the aerodynamics and flight uh, profile of that bird. Just as an aside, uh, the Wright brothers studied birds to figure out how to fly. They've been wanting to fly for 40, 50,000 years, and they finally, <coughs> the Wright brothers figured it out from looking at birds. This is a, uh, <coughs> a blue-eyed shag, which is a cormorant, also in Falkland Islands, carrying nesting material back and forth, sometimes with <coughs> great uh, difficulty because they're covered up their site with a bunch of vegetation. <coughs> As they're trying to collect the vegetation, they argue over the best stick. <coughs> so this is a Gen 2 penguin, <coughs> rear end. Um, and I photographed this because if they get too hot, they expose their feet to cool off, exposing their, their feet to the, <coughs> to the colder air. And I uh, couldn't help myself. This, I use uh, <coughs> Photoshop and Lightroom for, to manage my photographs, but I do very little modification, but I couldn't help myself. I turned this into a bird. <laughs> a pair of Gen 2 eyes on his butt. <coughs> it's kind of the definition of cute. This is a fur seal, southern fur seal baby, probably about a week old. This is an elephant seal, southern elephant seal pup. Um, sort of like the harp seal pup, they nurse for a very brief period of time, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, and they just grow like crazy. <coughs> so here he is doing acrobatics. <coughs> this guy's about a year old. Uh, he's actually fighting, play fighting with another one on the left. It looks sort of like a Dr. Seuss character to me. They're serious when they're adults. Now, southern elephant seals, <coughs> these are two big bulls, and each weigh about 6,000 pounds, about as much as a suburban. And <coughs> when they rear up, their head had almost hit this, hit this light. And, uh, and there's <coughs> a couple thousand pounds of smacking into each other, blood and snot blowing everywhere. And, uh, and everybody's got a lot of scars. There's an elephant seal trying to fly. <laughs> Actually, he's doing is cooling off, throwing cool, wet sand on himself. <clears throat> and I did a show one time on abstracts, and I found out basically all successful photographs have an abstract element to them. <clears throat> uh, shapes, textures, colors, and uh, <clears throat> so this is kind of a little subset. Yeah, I noticed um, earlier when you were showing the photos of like the, the penguin colony, I, I couldn't help but notice how abstract it was in the upper part. Were you taking that photo, um, like, when you were thinking, were you thinking about the abstractness, or were you thinking about most of the penguins? I was thinking most about abstractness, uh, because <clears throat> the story, again, like I said at the beginning, it's not just behavior, but it's <clears throat> the presence, the landscape, and all of that. And, and, and my definition of a successful photograph or painting is if I can get a viewer to look at it without distraction for five seconds, that's a successful photograph. That's a long time. I mean, I'm forcing you to look at some of these longer, but, um, <clears throat> but and what keeps their attention, I find, and everybody, okay, that's a guy, that's a penguin, but then they can walk around and, and of get immersed in the shapes and colors. It makes it a lot stronger. And good. These are just clouds, but Take textures are great. This is North Twin Lake in Yellowstone Park. Uh, <clears throat> vertical lines are the reflections of tree trunks on the far shore in the water, and then the horizontal stuff is a little partial skim of ice. <clears throat> this is, uh, I call these my Norwegian beach scene. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people see something else in there besides snow, but uh, those are piles of snow on rocks about the size of the chairs you're sitting on, three or four feet deep. <clears throat> this is a big 30-foot high snowdrift on top of Specimen Ridge in Hayden Valley. Again, the abstract shape and the depth uh, of, the <clears throat> of the curved line and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> there's a number of techniques that you use for creating this illusion of three dimensions. Um, <clears throat> There's two-dimensional stuff, left, right, top, to bottom, where you place things. But also you want to create the illusion of, of depth and, and volume and space. 
And I think every one of my photographs is successful that way because I think about them all the time. Um, these tools, I guess you'd call them. <clears throat> Again, shadows here, <clears throat> color change is one of these. Light, dark, light, dark. Get a sense that the dark stuff is beyond the white stuff and you've got white stuff beyond the dark stuff. <clears throat> Some cottonwoods in uh, Lamar Valley, about 30 below zero. This is a uh, uh, phenomenon called diamond dust. You can see some sparkles against those burned lodgepole pines in backlight uh, at gold light at sunrise. <clears throat> this is a year after the fires of 88. <clears throat> and I love what happened to the forests after they were burned. It's like this, the texture and, and shapes of the skeleton of an animal is beautiful by itself. This is sort of like the skeleton of a forest. <clears throat> Fairly traditional photograph here. That's Electric Peak uh, in autumn from uh, Gardner's Hole. Electric Peak from Swan Lake Flat. Um, <clears throat> again, sunrise right after, right after sunrise, actually. <clears throat> Yellowstone is my favorite place in the world still. My favorite part of Yellowstone, one of, one of the two places, is the Lamar Valley. Um, <clears throat> the other one is Thoroughfare. You'll see some pictures of Thoroughfare, too. <clears throat> Again, beautiful countryside, great place for wildlife. Uh, that's where, as you probably know, that's where they reintroduced the wolves after being gone for 70 years. They brought them back and turned them loose into the meat market of Safeway, basically, full of elk in Lamar Valley. And they prospered, as you know. <clears throat> Another shot of Electric Peak. This is before sunrise, that loudpin glow in the clouds creates that pink light on everything. <clears throat> it's part of the Absaroka Range uh, up near Cook City, sunset. This is the thoroughfare. <clears throat> this is uh, where the Yellowstone River runs into Yellowstone Park. Uh, it starts uh, on a mountain called Yount's Peak, which is outside of the park. <clears throat> flows north, clear to Livingston, and then turns and goes northeast and runs into the Missouri River up by North Dakota, just inside the North Dakota line. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> on the left, that stream that's going horizontally across there uh, is Thoroughfare Creek. There's a lake there called Bridger Lake. The Yellowstone River runs through that lake. Just below on the left, far left side <clears throat> in the timber right there, there's an occupied cabin there, a patrol cabin used by the Park Service. <clears throat> and uh, it's not available to the public. It's the most isolated occupied building in the United States outside of Alaska. And it's in Yellowstone Park. You know, you go to Old Faithful, there's 6,000 people standing on the boardwalk, but there's nobody up there. <clears throat> That's one of the things I like about it. <clears throat> this is a moose uh, after sunset, feeding underwater, pulling his head out, and letting the water run out of his nose. So a long exposure so they get the water cascading out of his nose. This is in uh, January. Moose bulls. This one's the hardest to arrange. Um, <clears throat> that's the thoroughfare again. And <clears throat> moose are goofy looking things. They're really comical in some ways. But I've got a little, quick little quiz. There's two little baby moose there, <clears throat> each about born for about the same time. <clears throat> and uh, they're about a week old. And one of them's a male and one's a female. Anybody know this? Secret to that, uh, mom holds the key. <clears throat> Females have a white spot under their tail. That'll be on one of Paul's quizzes. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, bison, one of my favorite animals. Um, and of course, Yellowstone Park, as you probably know, is set aside because uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad thought they could make a lot of money hauling tourists to this place. Uh, but, which they did for a while. Um, but it was also the thermal stuff. Uh, and I love interaction between these animals and the thermal areas. That's the base of Canary Spring Mammoth. And they, uh, again, bison are really tough. Uh, they couldn't handle high-powered rifles, but they figured when Columbus discovered himself in America 500 years ago, they figured there was at least 60, 40 to 60 million bison on this continent. By 1895, there were 1,500 left in the world. 
and 20 uh, Ted Turner's bison, which is just out west of here, are cattle. There's cattle genes mixed in with them. Uh, Yellowstone's herd bison are 100% purebred bison. Uh, they've shipped some of them out. <clears throat> There's a few in Wind Cave National Park and other places, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. But anyway, they're just amazing creatures. They're just <clears throat> durable. Uh, they figured they walked across the Bering Land Bridge about 250,000 years ago. They evolved in Asia and walked across to North America. When they came across <clears throat> uh, the Bering Land Bridge, there's <clears throat> some fossils. There's one Park Museum, Park County Museum in Livingston, <clears throat> and their, their horns were slightly curved and straight out six feet from tip to tip. And the big bull bison now weighs about 2,000 pounds. They estimate they weighed 3,000 pounds then. So they were pretty impressive. <clears throat> Still impressive. This is a bison cow. <clears throat> uh, it's about 30 below zero up in the upper geyser basin one spring or one winter morning. <clears throat> and uh, well, I shot this a long time ago, about 30 years ago, I guess. <clears throat> and some friends of mine called me up and said, uh, there's a Oh, it's on Instagram, this photograph of mine without my watermark. <clears throat> and uh, this guy from Belarus claims it's his photograph of a yak. And I said, we know it's not because it's your picture. <clears throat> Long story short, <clears throat> um, a bunch of people contacted how he'd run Instagram. I've never run Instagram. <clears throat> and uh, tried to straighten him out <clears throat> and uh, tell him he was lying. And, uh, I had a couple of European magazines did articles about my stuff. BBC, an Instagram account, they did an article about this and of my work. And the last count, I had over a million likes for this picture. But some people still think it's a yak from Belarus. <laughs> I can't do anything about that. <clears throat> my best selling photograph ever so far. Uh, it's 38 below zero this morning. Uh, and I stood out there for about three hours waiting for the light to come up and things to stand around in the right spot. I looked like them after the first hour. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, again, it goes back to that abstract thing. There's a bison cow on the lower left. You see a couple of heads, but you get the look and there's actually eight bison in there, kind of scattered around like, like mountains in the back. <clears throat> One of the things I love about these things, how tough they are, not only 38 below zero, but ground blizzards, they're just lying there, chewing their cuds taking a nap. <clears throat> I traveled to some pretty crazy places. I, as a backcountry skier, I would not ski down below that big cornice, but mm -hmm. kick it loose and bury yourself. Again, their interaction with the thermals, uh, they stand there and do a steam bath, the same as we would. This is the runoff channel for Grand Prismatic and Exelsior Geyser Crater. Crater. <clears throat> Now, I do a lot of things all over the world, but I can't swim. So I'm sort of jealous of this guy. They can swim really well across the Yellowstone River. <clears throat> but they don't always swim. They use bridges if they can. <clears throat> and uh, the mating season is July, August. And uh, <clears throat> they surprising quiet most of the time. But during the mating season, they sound, sound like a 2,000 pound pig, grunting and bellering and throwing dirt. And, fighting and all carrying on like crazy. Um, so they're a pretty impressive animal. <clears throat> and they're just sometimes just goofy. They're young guys dancing around. Now it's a bull elk in the late winter. I doubt he made it. It was a pretty long winter and he was pretty thin. But So he started acting sort of like a moose eating vegetation underwater. It's a mammoth hot springs dancing around. He's raking his antlers in the travertine. Um, I have no idea why, but he thought it was a good idea. <laughs> and this guy <clears throat> was raking his antlers around in the Christmas lights at Mammoth <clears throat> and uh, walking around with <clears throat> highly decorated for a while. Uh, the bad news is the Park Service had to tranquilize him and cut him off because he couldn't get him loose. And mountain goats, uh, these are young guys. They walk around on these rocks, and every time I see them walk out on the snowbank, they hop around like grasshoppers. I don't know why, but they just jump up and down because it feels funny in their feet, I guess. 
<clears throat> this is a young uh, mule deer that wasn't doing so well on this steep slope. Um, <clears throat> I'm tumbling and crashing down this steep slope. Great animal, pronghorn antelope. Um, <clears throat> it's the only ungulate uh, that's indigenous and na native to North America. Uh, <clears throat> and it's the second fastest land animal in the world. The fastest, of course, is the African cheetah. So the question, of course, is why do these pronghorn run so fast? What do they need that speed for? <clears throat> it's because up until about 15,000 years ago, there were five, four animals that could outrun a pronghorn. One of them was a short-faced short bear. <clears throat> One was a saber-toothed cat, a dire wolf, and uh, the other one just flew out of my head. Uh, oh, dire wolf. Anyway, there are four of them. <clears throat> and uh, they all went extinct, but the wrong one stuck around. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, they're cool animals. I can talk about them for a long time there. Uh, eyesight, like an eagle, that extra large heart, lung, and trachea. So unlike a cheetah, which can run for about a minute, and they're done, uh, they can run for like a half an hour, full speed. <clears throat> Early morning, uh, gold backlit frosted tree. I'm a nondescript little tree, but lighting is everything. And again, going back to your abstract stuff, think about that. It's shapes, just a nondescript tree, but what makes it work is that single gold line diagonally across there and then the ridge line of specimen ridge. <clears throat> Another sunrise shot at, uh, in Hayden Valley. Some Canada geese sailing along. <clears throat> Rainbows are cool. Um, <clears throat> this is Tower Fall in Yellowstone, north part of Yellowstone. And <clears throat> it's unusual here because <clears throat> the wind has to blow upstream and carry the mist up above the falls. That's kind of an unusual shot. Normally, this is the base of Tower Fall, <clears throat> and uh, you can't legally get to this spot anymore. The trail washed out, and they've never replaced it. But <clears throat> this rainbow is there for about two weeks out of the year, <clears throat> right during the summer solstice. And this is an unusual photograph. Some of you may have been there. Uh, this is Dananda Falls in the Beckler River in the southwest car corner of Yellowstone. This is a moon bow. This is shot at 1 o'clock in the middle of the night. And what a one minute exposure. <clears throat> and I love the moon. Um, it's our neighbor up there flying around above us all the time. This is a moon set. It's a moon rise. Pretty hard to tell the difference. <clears throat> and this is the moon. It's about midnight. A moon in the sky over Yellowstone, the southeast arm of Yellowstone Lake. And that's a bank of clouds lit internally by lightning. Moon, these are Ross's geese, like a snow goose migration. That's the moon uh, coming up there. That's the Castle Geyser in the Upper Geyser Basin. <clears throat> and the pink light is normal. It's a, after sunset, and the light source is this giant pink cloud behind me, shining this pink light come on everything. <clears throat> this photograph is something you can't see. This is a five hour long exposure of Star Tracks. North Star is on a little tiny arc on the far left side. <clears throat> and what I love about this is, except for the North Star, there's none of them are white. They're all different beautiful colors, depending on the temperature of the star. <clears throat> I'm just up here last week. This is the head of the Lamar. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a place called the Hoodoos. This is in the middle of the night as well. You can see the star tracks moving up above us there. <clears throat> and <clears throat> these are rock columns about 60 to 80 feet tall, the erosional features, and uh, Tim Cahill and I, Tim Cahill's a writer for the National Geographic, <coughs> and he, we were lighting these with flashlights, different colors. Northern Lights, this is in Iceland. Uh, <coughs> it's cool, they couldn't do these kind of photographs until just recently, the, the much more sensitive digital photography. Uh, in film days, you couldn't all you'd get was a smudge because you had to have a long exposure. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you could see this stuff, but you couldn't photograph it. <clears throat> um, so in film days, you know, 200 ISA film was a really good film. <clears throat> now I shot these at 25,000 ISO and still serviceable pictures. So I love the transition that photography has made 
<coughs> new technology is allows uh, me to get stuff I couldn't get before. I could see it, but I couldn't photograph it. <coughs> lightning, I love lightning. I love blizzards and lightning storms. <coughs> this is Old Faithful, early in the morning in winter. <coughs> this project I did for Georgia Tech in Atlanta uh, with an infrared camera. <coughs> and so one just sees heat, and that's Old Faithful. <coughs> Black is the sky, it's relatively cold, and the white is where it's the hottest. There's some aerial stuff, <coughs> I don't do much of that because I can't fly either, but <coughs> um, it's a project I did for the park, for Yellowstone Park. The visitor center at Old Faithful, <coughs> most of the photography in that building is mine. I donated <coughs> most of the stuff in there, and they didn't have any aerial stuff, so they put me in their helicopter, and. Uh, so the pilot's sitting over here where he's supposed to, running this machine. I'm sitting here, I took the door off, <coughs> and I'm sitting here with a couple of cameras in my lap and the seatbelt, of course, to make sure it was a good. <coughs> and as soon as I start to shoot, he tipped the helicopter on its side and spin in circles while I'm shooting out the window here. <coughs> and uh, he was a good pilot, but after about an hour, he had to flatten out and go get some fuel, and as soon as he flattened out, I threw up out of the side of his helicopter. <laughs> At least God. it was out the side. <laughs> Pardon? At least it was out the side, not <laughs> on the side. <laughs> Going about 80 miles an hour, it didn't log outside, but he didn't want me in his helicopter after that. But here you can see, what I think called the eyes of the earth, it's hot springs boiling up through this grand prismatic spring feature. Uh, to give a relative size, there's some people on the boardwalk on the left side there. And uh, a <clears throat> gorgeous uh, feature in Yellowstone. And Mammoth Hot Springs, uh, geysers are cool, uh, they're unusual, rare. Hot Springs are more common, but <clears throat> uh, Mammoth Hot Springs I find more interesting because it's much more dynamic. <clears throat> I did a, uh, help collaborate on a college textbook for uh, research this fellow at the University of Illinois did. He studied Mammoth Hot Springs for about 20 years, and again, Bruce Falk, <clears throat> he's a limestone expert. Um, he was one of the people who decided where to land the Mars rover, because they're looking for life on Mars, and this features mammoth, is travertine rock, calcium carbonates, <clears throat> but the shapes are driven by bacteria. <clears throat> so without the bacteria, you don't get any of these shapes. So they figure if they see anything that looks like this on Mars, there is or has been life on Mars. <clears throat> and he says uh, Mammoth Hot Springs covers, it's a complex of springs covering about a square mile. It might be 15 to 20 springs. And cumulatively, he says, they produce 50 tons of rock a day. <clears throat> so people stand around and say, this doesn't look the same as it did when I was a kid. And they say, it doesn't look the same as it did yesterday, because that's a lot of rock that had cumulatively there. <coughs> um, this is <coughs> Cat, um, Canary Spring, uh, one of the, presently one of the largest, or is the largest one right now, and uh, <coughs> pretty extensive. And in my photographing this for about 30 years, the bottom of this stuff, the gray uh, rock travertine that's now the bacteria and the hot water's moved to another spot, that's about 30 feet of rock sitting there that was in 30 years, cumulative, just on one spring. Angel Terrace, and this is the throat of one of the springs. <clears throat> it's about 74 degrees centigrade, and the first life that can tolerate that is at 73 degrees centigrade, and uh, <clears throat> it's a long stringy string of bacteria, the fastest growing creature in the world. Uh, it grows three inches a day, and it accumulates travertine on the surface of that, uh, <clears throat> that string of bacteria. And uh, <clears throat> Bruce re refers to it as fettuccine. <clears throat> and some of those uh, more decayed, or not decayed, it's that those old structures like the first one I was showing you, now it <clears throat> changes uh, volume on this, uh, this hot spring. Sometimes it overruns previous stuff. <clears throat> and this is the canary spring on thermal imaging. Uh, so what you're seeing is the yellow stuff on the top, red stuff is hotter, down to cool stuff, and the little dancing bear in the middle is just a cold piece of rock. 
<clears throat> Upper Geyser Basin, early morning fog. Fog in the trees. <clears throat> Again, the abstract stuff, this is more obvious. This is a couple of hillsides in the Lamar Valley at late evening. <clears throat> Same ridges, different, different year. Again, sunset on those ridges. Storm in Antarctica, swirling, picking up snow. And more ab abstract, this is a <clears throat> runoff channel or pattern in the sand. And a group of animals called mustelids, uh, weasels. Uh, this is a, a weasel that lives in heavy timber and eats squirrels and chipmunks, called pine marten. This is a weasel or a mustelid that learned to swim, called a river otter. This is one of the smaller ones. This is an ermine, a uh, short-tailed weasel. Remember, the fox had a long-tailed weasel. <clears throat> so the long-tailed weasel body is about this long, short-tailed weasels, the body's about that long. So a big short tail is about the same size as a small long tail, so they're kind of hard to tell apart. But <clears throat> this guy was really bold, uh, <clears throat> got tired of looking at me and kind of made a couple of runs at me to chase me away. <clears throat> it's only this tall, <laughs> gutsy little guy. <clears throat> but what he was after was a, a metal bowl. And <clears throat> down about three or four feet down under the snowbank, I could hear this squeaking and carrying on kill this guy, this metal bull, came back up and ran off of that thing, and uh, <clears throat> about half his size. <clears throat> this is a great gray owl, uh, <clears throat> same owl as the first couple of photographs. Uh, <clears throat> he's got a pocket gopher under his chin there. And this is in October of 88, right after the fires, so it was a really interesting time to be there environmentally too because of the transition, about 700,000 acres of Yellowstone burned. Um, <clears throat> not as big as the California fires, but they were big. And uh, the whole ecosystem uh, changed for a while. Changed for the better, actually. <clears throat> Typical uh, great gray owl habitat. They nest and roost in heavy timber and come out in more open grasslands to feed. These are two young, great horned owls. A uh, <clears throat> uh, bunch of work with raptors over the years, and uh, these are the only raptors I've ever seen that liked each other. Um, <clears throat> this is a, they snuggled and groomed each other, and, and <clears throat> eagles and other raptors generally don't like each other in the nest. Bald eagles, for example, generally have two eggs, and generally only one of them survives, because the bigger one either kills the other one or pushes it out of the nest. Great horned owl just stretching. <clears throat> so this is a yellow-headed blackbird on the upper left there, or a black-bodied yellowbird, adult male. <clears throat> and you see how you're supposed to land in these tule reeds. You fly in, grab a couple of them, and they bend down. Well, the chick in the lower right hadn't figured that out yet. So he had one foot in the boat and one on the dock, and he, he fell in three times. Stretched him out and fell in. So <clears throat> I don't know how long he survived. That's a broad-tailed hummingbird. Bald eagles, kind of a majestic uh, sunset light. <clears throat> this is a duck called a harlequin duck. And this is a, one of the things you can do different here. <clears throat> this is with a slow shutter speed to get a sense of the motion of the water blurring past. Um, <clears throat> this is in the Hardy Rapids in Yellowstone. And you do a fast shutter speed, and that's a harlequin duck in this fast, fast water, where it sort of turns into glass. And, uh, again, totally different feel, same kind of photograph in a way. Flight shot, this is a great uh, a sand hill crane. <clears throat> Trumpeter swans. Um, they groom and preen, and then when they're done, generally they'll stand up and flare those wings out to rearrange the primary feathers. <clears throat> These are American white pelicans on the left, feeding in shallow water, and then the great blue heron on the right, after the same thing, you know, small fish. A rock wren, <clears throat> a little bigger than a golf ball. 
is a Brewer's Blackbird. Uh, territorial call in the spring. They're abstract. These are wings, feathers of a black chin sparrow. It's a northern harrier, a uh, small hawk. And what he's doing, he's standing on his wing, turning around, and there's a little bird in the lower right corner, <coughs> a pipit, uh, <coughs> that he was hunting, and he got it. There he is, got this pipit under his foot, under his armpit there. This is the golden eagle. Uh, <coughs> coyotes have killed that big horned sheep, and this guy is just scavenging uh, after the coyotes were done. Bald eagle, and this is in Minnesota. <coughs> a project I did photographing the nest in Bayport, Minnesota. <coughs> so here's the adult male bringing in a fish to the nest. Uh, the female is on the left there. <coughs> now the male brings the food and <coughs> rarely helps feed it. It just leaves the food, and, and the female stays there, pulls it apart, and feeds the chicks or the eaglets. And uh, you can tell them apart when they're side by side. The female's probably about 15% bigger than the male. And they're kind of goofy looking. That's our national symbol right there. <laughs> <coughs> so after the male drops off the food, here brought a small turtle. Uh, she pulls apart meat and, and feeds those chicks. <coughs> so here, <coughs> uh, she had two chicks and <coughs> she was feeding the other one. And the neglected one got really impatient and started pulling her tail to remind her she had two babies. And uh, pulled it about three times. And finally she turned around and looked at it and I'm like, stop that. <clears throat> and they also brought in uh, sticks and grass and whatnot <clears throat> to resupply and rebuild the nest. <clears throat> and here he brought in this stick, this random stick with things sticking off in all directions. And he, Fought that for about 15 minutes trying to get it to lay flat. It never lay flat. He whacked the kids and, and finally threw it over the side and gave it up. <laughs> Unusual here, this is the, you see the female on the left is a little bigger. Uh, and both of them feeding the chicks, which is, I only saw that once in, in, in 40 days of sitting up there. Waiting for food. <clears throat> Black-billed magpie, uh, great bird. I love this bird. <clears throat> it said brain size is a proportion of body weight is a measure of intelligence. This is one of the smartest birds in the world, and uh, they are very, very smart, <clears throat> very, uh, a lot of fun to watch. <clears throat> There's three of them on a backbone of an elk that have been killed by wolves in Le Mans. Yeah, abstract shapes too. <clears throat> now raven. Uh, another great bird related to the to the magpie, uh, Corvidia family, Corvids, and uh, <clears throat> that elk cow had been killed by wolves, and that grizzly bear found the carcass <clears throat> and uh, became pretty annoyed at those all those ravens in there. It's a raven with a mouse can't talk because he's mouseful. <clears throat> Probably never seen another one of these. This is a yellow, or excuse me, a red-winged blackbird. Uh, it's not an albino. It's called Lukeism, which isn't very creative. It means whiteism. Um, but again, he still has the red apulets and some black feathers, but mostly white. Um, a kestrel, uh, bringing in a mouse to a nest. Um, <clears throat> beautiful, the smallest falcon in, the, in North America. Uh, that's a young male, uh, more red or more of that rust color and that darker reddish colors on the on the on the male than the female. And they nest in <coughs> abandoned uh, woodpecker and flicker holes, and <coughs> this is in a cottonwood log. And there were five of these guys in that in that hole there, you know, fighting over who gets to watch the scenery. <coughs> Here's one of the female. Uh, juvenile female out trying to figure out how to fly, flapping these wings around, <clears throat> trying to build up nerve to jump off. He was admiring his toenails. <clears throat> so this is the story Paul mentioned earlier. This was, uh, uh, I was out skiing in 
Yel in uh, Lamar <coughs> about 35 years ago, come across these little mouse tracks. <coughs> it was on the surface of the snow, going visiting these little grass stems, <coughs> stand up on his hind feet. I never saw any of this, I just recreated this story. Neat grass seeds, <coughs> hopped around, followed him for about 200 yards probably, and all of a sudden I realized he took a left turn, made six jumps, and a bird got him. So the body of the bird <coughs> and the tail feathers going off to the left. Wing feathers were out like this. When he flew away, his wings came together and <coughs> flew off with it. <coughs> and and uh, a great story. I mean, unless you're a mouse. Um, <coughs> and this was shot on Kodachrome film a long time ago. And Kodak used it one year in a calendar. <coughs> and uh, unbeknown to me, <coughs> they entered in a contest for the best wildlife photography and calendars in the world. Anything about it until they called me up and said, "Congratulations, you run, you won the grand prize." And I said, "In what?" <coughs> so they told me what it was. Roger Torrey Peterson Institute is a sponsor. <coughs> they told me what the prize was, and I said, uh, "Well, that's pretty nice." <coughs> and uh, I said, "Can I give this to somebody else because I don't really want it, or can I have a couple thousand dollars worth of film?" And I was thinking of Kodak, <coughs> and they said, "No, sorry. <coughs> it was a photography workshop in Yellowstone Park in the winter." <laughs> which I do that for a living, so I didn't want their prize. <laughs> so they gave me a brass medal instead. Again, reconstructing what happens in the tracks, I love that. It's up on top of uh, <coughs> Druid Peak in Lamar, and it's a, <coughs> a dusky grouse had flown in towards where I'm standing, hit the snow, skidded along, and then stood up and walked all the way back. And I don't really know, understand why it didn't just land over there and save itself the commute. <clears throat> Remember the Adeli penguins on the ice? <clears throat> on the far right side, you can see where one shot up out of the water, walked up there, sat for a while, and then went down to the left. Well, his friend tried to do the same thing. He just did a face plant <laughs> on the side of the snow. <clears throat> the favorite bear again, that's 264 in Obsidian Creek with two cubs. Uh, she was there for a week. <clears throat> Her left front foot is on the backbone of a bison cow that had winter killed. <clears throat> and uh, she spent the whole week, the three of them, <clears throat> consuming that bison. <clears throat> One of the things I miss, I try to dispel somewhat, is that grizzly bears are terrible, dangerous animals. <clears throat> I follow these guys around for about a week, courting pair of grizzly bears, and uh, I spent a lot of time around bears. I've probably had at least a thousand grizzly encounters over the years. Uh, I've been charged three times, which is a pretty intense experience. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but most of the time, they, they <clears throat> don't run off, which they usually will do if they see you. Um, they're pretty tolerant animals. Uh, the problem is we don't behave well, <clears throat> and, and they defend themselves, whatever, and then they're blamed for terrible, being a terrible animal. <clears throat> but when you do have a so tolerant bear, <clears throat> this is in Hayden Valley, I really enjoy people photographing grizzly bears with their television sets. <laughs> <clears throat> but she was a really good bear, uh, <clears throat> amazingly tolerant. But again, the problem <clears throat> they're having is us. And uh, <clears throat> I can go into the discussion about delisting bear, bears, busy bears, and all of that. Um, <clears throat> in some ways, we need to <clears throat> um, give them more space. Uh, they deserve it. And, uh, they don't have to negotiate traffic like this. <clears throat> um, people don't think of bears in the snow. Uh, this is in March, early March, just after the hibernation. And there's <clears throat> two big males that came here. This is Blacktail Ponds near Mammoth. <clears throat> and there's a couple of grizzly or bison carcasses fallen into this pond and drowned. And uh, so that springtime <clears throat> thaws out, they come and scavenge these carcasses. <clears throat> and one of them was a female, a bison cow, <clears throat> and uh, struggled and struggled. These bears pull that carcass out. And, and one morning, like, this guy pulled the fetus, fetus out of that carcass. And uh, <clears throat> I'd seen him <clears throat> eat fetuses before. This time they just carried it off and left it. Amazes me, this wolves killed this cow elk and ate probably 25% of it. <clears throat> I watched her for five hours uh, 
lost or find it <coughs> and uh, shave half of it in about $5. It's probably 250 pounds of meat, probably 200 pounds of meat anyway. And then she went off and laid down for about five hours and then came back and ate most of the rest of it. <laughs> I guess she didn't know when she was going to have pizza again. <coughs> oh my gosh. Another feeding behavior that's really a lot of fun, this is a black bear cub up in the top of a white bark pine tree. <coughs> white bark pines, <coughs> another victim of global warming, uh, <coughs> is uh, dying because it's too warm, <coughs> because of the pine bark beetle. But they're a cone about the size of your fist, and they're full of, of uh, these nuts, uh, pinion pine nuts. They make pesto out of them. They taste just exactly the same. They're really, really good. Um, most of the time, they steal caches from uh, squirrels and Clark's nutcrackers. But this guy was about 80 feet off the ground eating these cones. Uh, smart bears were on the ground catching them. and dropped. <laughs> Typical habitat for bighorn sheep. Uh, crazy, difficult stuff. Um, Got to remember, the two most common uh, causes of mortality of bighorn sheep are avalanches and falls. But again, very agile. I have a lot of respect for that. The diamond dust again. Cold, uh, super cold morning. The cold air is freezing. Uh, humidity, basically. And uh, looking towards the light source through the sun, where there's a sparkly columns of stuff. <coughs> and trees, <coughs> they're easier to photograph some ways than animals. They don't run around on you so much. Uh, <coughs> this is over West Thumb Geyser Basin, uh, covered with frost. Forest covered with frost. Again, cold stuff, abstract shapes, sense of depth, three dimensions. <coughs> See, I like cold. <coughs> this is Pacific Creek, north end of uh, the Tetons. This is kind of an experiment. This is a zoom lens and multiple exposure. So it's like, it like eight or ten exposures, <coughs> just some fall colors. And uh, each time I take one picture, I zoom it a little bit and rotate the lens, zoom it and rotate. <coughs> Wildflowers in Lamar. Flying flowers, it's called a copper blue butterfly. Some African birds. <clears throat> this is a lilac breasted roller. <clears throat> it's a little bigger than a robin. Spectacular colors. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is jumping and flying away. And uh, they have the name roller because of their, some of their mating behavior. They fly up high and they tumble in the air. These are <clears throat> malachite. Uh, not Malik, excuse me. Um, <coughs> Beater, just lost the name again. Anyway, they're a bead or <coughs> about uh, eat all kinds of flying insects <coughs> and uh, in Central Africa. It's a white fronted beater um, <coughs> and uh, also in Central Africa. This is a ground hornbill, G R O U N D, <coughs> eating a snail. They're about the size of a small turkey, a big bird. <clears throat> this is a crowned crane. We have sandhill cranes here. It's about the same size, only this guy's got a gray hat, sort of like better than the queen. <clears throat> this is a uh, one of the most dangerous animals in Africa, <clears throat> Cape buffalo. Yeah, it stood off by a hurt egret. The African wild dog, they're in real trouble. They're extremely rare, um, cool animal. They basically they run their animals to death. And uh, <coughs> they're about, on the table, they're probably about that tall. Bigger than a coyote, but not as big as a wolf. Lions, these are two brothers, like bookends. <coughs> Another African cat, this is the leopard. Uh, it's got a catfish. Very large catfish in scavenging. <clears throat> this is a young leopard looking at its mom up in the tree. From a non traditional picture of, an el of a giraffe. Pretty, pretty agile, actually. <clears throat> Again, talk about abstract. These are hippos fighting. 
mostly noise. Sunset, a big elephant taking a nap, a nap taking a bath. <coughs> Slow shutter speed motion blur of a, a lioness. <coughs> this is in uh, uh, the Okavango Delta, and it's dry there most of the year. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so they built these uh, wells, and so there's elephants are standing on this concrete pad that's <coughs> pumping water with a solar pump. <coughs> and they were standing around loafing, and about 15 lions show up who were thirsty. <coughs> and, uh, he went around trying to sneak in there to get some water, and the elephants kept chasing him away. Finally, the elephants got so frustrated with him, they started spitting on the lions. It wasn't real effective. <clears throat> you know, as long as I don't take any pho photographs of people, but I love this fellow in the dugout canoe in Zam Zambia, uh, stringing a net. <clears throat> so this, the habitat, or my favorite animal in the world, I had to pick one. That's where they live. This is in Central Africa, in Rwanda. <clears throat> and this is the animal, it's the mountain gorilla. And uh, <clears throat> I've had a chance to see them, see them 14 times, 14 day, different days. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I take people there every time, and usually, <clears throat> first time people see them, uh, they start to cry, because they're so beautiful. <clears throat> uh, they're smart, they're huge. Um, and, and very human-like, I guess. And uh, so this is a little guy playing with his toes. He's contemplating the world. This is about a year and a half, two-year-old. It's a big silverback male. Um, and uh, first time I went to see them was in Zaire about 25 years ago, now called the Congo. First time I see him, you get him out every single time I've gone. You pay, right now it's $1,500 a day per person, and you have one hour. So you walk in with a guide, with guns, <clears throat> trackers, whatever. As soon as you make visual contact, they start the clock. You have one hour. At the end of that hour, you have to go home, and nobody else goes in there after that. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so the first day, the, gu the guide said, um, <clears throat> said, when they charge, don't move. It wasn't if, it was when. I didn't pay much attention. <clears throat> and uh, so as soon as we made visual contact, here comes this silverback male. <clears throat> um, they weigh about 500 pounds, a grizzly bear in Yellowstone. A big one is 300 pounds. And their head's about this big around. They got canine teeth as big as your thumb. And he comes screaming up to us, throwing dirt, and stops like right there. <clears throat> For the first three or four times, I jumped behind the guide. <laughs> I was like, <clears throat> you take care of this. <clears throat> and after a while, I could stand still. And he charged us about 15 times in the first 45 minutes. And the last time, he came screaming up to us, <clears throat> guide's right here, I can stand still now, throwing dirt, yelling, goes down the road. There's me, my client, some pygmy men, they're shaking their machetes at this gorilla, <clears throat> which I didn't think was a very good idea. And he goes down the row and he pulls this tree out of the ground, about as big around as my arm, tall as this <clears throat> ceiling jerks out of the ground, slams it down, looks at us like, if that was your neck, that's what I would do. <clears throat> we went home. <clears throat> so I wasn't sure I wanted to go back. <clears throat> uh, the next day, uh, <clears throat> we went to another group with a different guide. <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of their um, um, hazards, I guess you'd call it, <clears throat> are snares. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I didn't bring one. I should have brought, I brought one I picked up twisted root, a little piece of uh, piano wire in a little loop. And the spring is a live tree and they rig it up so that it <clears throat> walks along, catches a chicken or a light bird or whatever. And the babies, <clears throat> if they get in a snare, they can't get loose, they're not strong enough. Adults can usually break that. <clears throat> and so that wire <clears throat> can cinch down on their hand, their finger, their arm, their foot, <clears throat> until either they starve to death or the finger eventually falls off, dies and falls off. <clears throat> so there's quite a few of them missing fingers or missing a hand. Remember Diane Fossey, her favorite gorilla is called Digit because you only had one finger left. <clears throat> so there was this one young male, <clears throat> it was almost as big as a silverback. <clears throat> the silverback is over there 
feeding and <clears throat> climbs up this big tree and there's these nuts about this big around. Rather than go along picking them out of the tree, he goes out on this branch and jumps up and <laughs> crashes it down to the ground, thumps, and sits on the ground eating nuts. <clears throat> so I'm watching this guy <clears throat> and, and this one smaller male was missing these three fingers. <clears throat> and they called him pork chop for whatever reason. So I'm sitting on a log, <clears throat> and we light, so this is in the film days. <clears throat> so I'm mostly just enjoying watching. And pork chop comes up and sits down right beside me on the log, puts his hand on my thigh, and his head is right here. And it's like <clears throat> I just almost killed the next the day before with this guy guy. I said, This is really cool, but it is sure is scary. <clears throat> and he sat there and looked at me for about a minute and got up and walked away. And <clears throat> You know, those kind of experiences, I didn't get a photograph of them, but bonded me to these things. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and another time, the last time I was there, a couple years ago, <clears throat> um, the guy was telling me these snares are still there. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and they've got people living with these gorillas <clears throat> during the day to protect them from being killed. Because they're worth, I remember, $1,500 a day per person, <clears throat> and there's about 100 people a day from all over the world go to see them. That's a lot of money. These are very, very valuable. They're worth about 20 bucks to eat them, called bush meat. <clears throat> and so to disrupt the economy of Rwanda, they kill a bunch of gorillas. So they're guarding them. <clears throat> so the people that are guarding them <clears throat> become basically trust, the gorillas trust these people. And they said, the problem they have is if the gorillas find a snare and they recognize the snare, they won't let the people go get the, take the snare apart. They have to wait until the gorillas move away, sneak back to take the snare apart. So they recognize good people from bad people. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> another time they said, the park is, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how big it is, it's not huge. It's probably. 50,000 acres, maybe. <clears throat> and uh, it's surrounded by a big rock wall, and outside the rock wall is potato fields. <clears throat> and like in Montana, some places along the road ditches, just people staking out their horses for the free grass in the ditches. In Rwanda, they do the same thing on these goats. <clears throat> so they've got the goats staked out in the halter. <clears throat> and, and these gorillas came out, this family came out one day, <clears throat> walked through the potato fields, didn't eat potatoes. So they were just, tourists, and they saw this little goat tied up, and <clears throat> they surrounded the goat, freaked the goat out, and they untied him and let him go. They thought he was in a snare. <clears throat> I just, I love the goats, because they're smart, and they have a heart. This is mom, admiring her baby, <clears throat> and this is probably one of my favorite little episodes. This little baby was about Two weeks old, maybe, and uh, she was sure proud of proud of each other, kissing each other, and uh, <clears throat> showing her little baby off. Said, <clears throat> "I would." <clears throat> there's about 800 of them in the world. Uh, <clears throat> Diane Fossey is the reason they still exist at all. Um, <clears throat> she was murdered uh, because of her work to protect these things, and uh, <clears throat> she exposed. Um, the gorillas used mountain gorillas used to be in zoos. The ones that are in zoos now are lowland gorillas. They look different than these. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the only way you could get one in the zoo if you if you caught an adult and put him in a box, they'd die of a broken heart. The only way you can get a baby or one to live is if you catch it as a baby. So what they were doing, <clears throat> um, Mbutu in Zaire was <clears throat> selling baby gorillas for like a million dollars a piece <clears throat> for zoos. And the only way she exposed this, the only way you could kill, get one, is if you machine gunned the entire family and took the dead baby off of its mother. <clears throat> they would live, but they never reproduced. <clears throat> so when she exposed that story, why, <clears throat> she he kicked her out of, out of Zaire and she moved to Rwanda. Anyway, <clears throat> on a totally different so topic, <clears throat> this is a map of Yellowstone Park. Um, right above my computer in my office. 
the year after I graduated from college here, 1985, <coughs> did a solo trip, I skied across Yellowstone Park solo, Flag Ranch, across here, <coughs> 175 miles in 14 days. So <coughs> that first morning of my solo trip, skied into the south entrance of the park, to get a backcountry permit, <coughs> uh, was not gonna be a solo trip, Started out with six people that were going to go with me. Uh, <clears throat> I steadily found reasons not to go. The last guy bailed out 30 minutes before we were supposed to leave. He said his dog got sick. <clears throat> and uh, so I decided I was ready. I had time. I was in shape. So I'd do it as solo. <clears throat> so I left the road right there, the south entrance, to go east along the south boundary of the park. And my first obstacle, which I knew about, was the Snake River there. It leaves the park right there at the south entrance. So I um, brought a little pair of wool socks to wear as traction to cross this river, because there's no bridge there, there's no ice, because there's hot springs up about five or six miles. The river's about 32 degrees. But <clears throat> so I got there to the shore. It's five degrees above zero, <clears throat> which is still kind of nippy. And <clears throat> Trump Mountain Snow on the edge of the river, <clears throat> take off my clothes, I'm naked from the waist down, tie my clothes on, my skis, my, <clears throat> my uh, clothes, <clears throat> start across the river with this, my waist belt loose, in case I fell down, I could get rid of my pack, <clears throat> use my ski poles to balance, and <clears throat> I got across, <clears throat> fine, it was about knee deep, of course, <clears throat> wipe the water off, put dry clothes on, so I take the clothes off, of course, I'm cold and numb, and uh, get dressed, <clears throat> and took off to warm up, and I made it about 25 yards, and I found out I was on an island. <laughs> I hate it when that happens, because no matter which way I go, i got to do it again. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now I, the socks had frozen solid, <clears throat> so I <clears throat> did it again. I dropped it down, I had to stick the socks in the river to kind of loosen them up so I could get them back on again. It was waist deep in the second half of that crossing. So that's the first morning after I crossed the river, the second, the second half of the river. <clears throat> kind of a bad start. In 14 days, it stormed for 12 days. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> closed all the roads around Yellowstone for three days while I was out there. And of course, nobody knew where I was. That was <clears throat> way before cell phones, satellite phones. And uh, <clears throat> so I I was really stuck my neck out to do it. But <clears throat> one of the things that, <clears throat> a couple, one of the things that really sticks in my mind the most, I've done a lot of these trips, you remember saw the map, um, about 48, 45, 48 overnight trips over the years, maybe a couple thousand miles cumulatively. <clears throat> and I've only heard it once. I was out about three days after this, this photograph was made, I was up Harebell Creek <clears throat> along the south boundary of the park, and I was <clears throat> stop for a, a snack, nothing to sit on, you got 10 feet of snow everywhere. So I'm standing there with my pack beside me, and I'm eating some M&Ms, good excuse for chocolate, and I hear this, and I look around like, what's that? It was my heart. <clears throat> it was so quiet, from then on in my sleeping bag, or whatever, uh, I could hear my heart beating, <clears throat> and, it, and it's almost a spiritual experience for me, because <clears throat> it felt more like I belonged than any other, any other trip I've ever done. <clears throat> I've been on other solo trips since, too. That extended experience um, sort of felt like it was connected to the place better than ever before or since. <clears throat> so one of the two of the mornings that were clear, this is up on Big Game Ridge, that's the Tetons off to the southwest of me. <clears throat> kind of just turning the other direction. This is looking north. Um, <clears throat> there's a flat spot there in the upper right below the mountains. That's the Red Mountains, Mount Sheridan. That's Hart Lake. <clears throat> and then way in the distance on the horizon, I didn't want to think about too much. That's Electric Peak. That's up where Gardner is. That's my destination. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so I still had 125 miles to go. <clears throat> and. Uh, What's also cool here, if you look in the foreground there, there's tracks, and those are mountain lion tracks. And one of the few, I never did see the cat, 